promised. I was wondering who had a prayer request or something just to praise God about that they wanted to share with the congregation. I have good hearing. If you stand up and or tell, tell, me, tell me that, I will, I will remember to lift it up. And let me, st- uh, now, and I won't make you stay here forever if nobody does, but let me share uh, again uh, uh, Cindy's nephew Jacob uh, in, in Oregon, gave a, a piece of his liver uh, to, to be transplanted into a great nephew, Gabriel, and, uh, and they are both improving this week. We're so glad that it was it's for Gabriel did turn three over the week, and, and uh, that is still very touch and go for him, so we, we covet your prayers for them. And so we just want to, you know, want to lift that up. Is, is there another prayer request that you'd like to share? Okay, we're going to keep moving. I'm going to pray, okay? Sounds like sound. All right. So, Father, we ask that, that this day you, you call our hearts to, to draw near to you. Let us, let us, Lord, again learn how to rely upon you, find you, our source in you. But also, Lord, we lift up the, the sick among us. Lord, we, we lift up our cancer patients, each and every one. We're kind of naming them in our hearts. Lord, for those that are, that are stricken, as we say, by age, that there's issues of dementia and Alzheimer's and, and diminished capacity. And Lord, we ask that there be blessings in their lives and in their hearts. Be with those that, that the doctors are very concerned. There's they're nothing they can do for them. And, and families wait and families support a loved one when there isn't hope of cure. Lord, we ask for, for those that are, that are particular, that, that this has been a week of, of calamity or injury and great peril. And we ask, Lord, for, for healing for those, those that, that need your touch. And for, Lord, we, we set the week ahead in your hands. What we will be met with is challenges, uh, the, the, the difficulties that will arise, the great fears, the things the doctors might say, or, or that situation at work or home or school we lay these in your hands lord knowing of your great power lord Lord, knowing that none of this comes as a surprise for you but you are prepared and you're willing and you're gracious to help we lord we pray for our nation ask that our nation have your protection and your blessing upon it that you guide us lord into the path that we should go together as a community Lord, bless those that, that guard and protect this nation in the military and shorten that time that they are deployed away from family. Lord, we pray for a world that, that so needs peace in so many places, and Ukraine comes to mind. And we remember, Lord, those that are driven from their homes because of war. And ask, Lord, that there be help and, and relief for them, that you'd, you would bring the houseless back to their own homes. Lord, we pray for places in the world that have poverty such as we never see, and, Lord, that, that, that there be, be relief that happens, and also, Lord, that, that, that Christians be part of bringing a world that, that knows your plenty in the hands of each and every one. We pray for the food insecure. We pray for those ravaged by diseases. And, Lord, we ask also for the community that we live in. Bless the churches in this community, each one. Bless those that preach this morning. Lord, bless our, our, the homes of the neighbors that we know and the ones that we don't. Set your peace upon those homes, Lord, and also your provision. Lord, I ask, ask that you take the, the inward requests that we have, the ones that we're not naming aloud. Lord, you know all about it. And Lord, we're, we're setting our, our, our hopes entirely upon you. And Lord, we pray for the church that's not free, that knows in so many parts of the globe what it is to be to be cast out of your community, to be put in prison, to go to death and torture for the faith. We ask, Lord, that you uphold and bless your martyr church. Let all that is given before us, before, before you today, Lord, we know it is before your altar in heaven. We ask, Lord, that your help and your care and your blessing be on these prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll give you just a minute to find Jeremiah chapter 11. Yes, go on. Okay. Because Jeremiah chapter 11 is where the the Word of God is is being read today. And it is the first eight verses, which reads, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
You shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God. Then I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as at this day. Then I answered, So be it, Lord. And the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them, for I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Lord, when your prophet calls us to obey, to heed, to listen, let our consciences, let our hearts be open to you. Wound us, Lord. Grab us, Lord. Where, where we need your touch. Where we need to be open and, and, and obedient. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And... Uh, now, looking at the sermon title, which says Jeremiah keeps it simple, you you should this you should uh, find as no surprise that it, that we're going to look at the the simple words, the simple uh, exhortation that Jeremiah gives. In fact, the most complicated religious word in here is, is covenant, and and it's really not that hard to hard to get at this. Otherwise, the thing is like first one and two syllable words, and Jeremiah says in in a number of ways about that you've been given the word of God and for you the time is to come to obey it and to hear it. And in fact, this, this was it, the sort of thing that you're not going to get new teaching out of this and that, that nobody said to, when they heard Jeremiah say this and then as you see in the, the kind of the second movement of it, that he said to go out to all the cities in Judah, all the places around Jerusalem and, and, and proclaim these very things. Nobody said, did you hear that newfangled preaching that Jeremiah gave today? This is not newfangled preaching. He, is, he really is saying, you know the, what the word of the Lord says. You can find that out. You can, you, can, you can get that in your head. And this is what you need to obey. You need to hear it, listen to it, and be part of it. He uses in, this, in these eight verses some sense of God's word that is to be listened to, that you need to obey it, or conversely, that you're not obeying it. He says this. He uses a word related to that like 20 times in these eight verses. And Jeremiah is giving, giving to the people something they're, they're aware of, of, of what this is all about. He, in fact, if you really like your, your teaching, you know, boiled down and simple, you realize he's got about eight verses here that would do pretty well to summarize the whole book of Deuteronomy. It's all there. God's promises, uh, God's, God's rescuing people out of Egypt, that he did this by his hand and sent his word to Moses, that he gave his word and his law, and it says to listen and to listen and to heed these words and to live by these words. In fact, the, the way it pl- pans out is Deuteronomy does this very thing. He, again, words related to hearing, obeying the word of God, the covenant, God's promise, you know, listen, about, a, about 160 times that's brought up in Deuteronomy. In other words, about five times a chapter. So Jeremiah gives in these eight verses what Deuteronomy was all about. That God has come and he has, has made these promises. He's brought this to pass. You are to live by this. And that's what he's saying in very simple, short terms. Now, in his day, it was working like this. There were, there were always... Uh, there were always different voices speaking to people, different things calling to people to attention, lies and deceptions that, that drew people away from God. And Jeremiah, just giving this in this very short, short and simple way, is cutting through that. He's cutting through that to, to say, look, I, I know somebody's saying, oh, we should all go worship Baal, or there's a festival to Asherah down here, or, or do you want to bake cakes to the Queen of Heaven? You know, that's, you know, let's do... But just taking all that, all that smoke and mirrors, all those things that, that deceive and call people away. And Jeremiah said, you know, 
by virtue of the fact that you live in Jerusalem and you are Israel, that you have a God that you are part of his story. He has called you to this point. He's made you to this, and you need to heed him and obey him. It kind of cuts through that it, with a very direct stroke. Now, that is where we have a problem in our day with, with Jeremiah just, just saying, look, you know, I, and you need to obey the word of God. He is absolutely right. This is the answer, and I can give you the answer, not, not you know, two and a half minutes into the talk. The answer is that whatever situation you're facing, whatever temptation it might be, uh, whatever the circumstances which are very challenging, whatever you've heard on the news, or, or that you see looming in your future or boiling away in your past, you need to draw yourself and get close to Jesus. You get close to Jesus, hear his word, ponder it in your heart, you know, find, you know, examine it, work with it, and obey it. T saying to a, a world in crisis, as Jeremiah was, his community was, was in a great deal of trouble. You just need to heed the word of God. You begin to, that's where you begin. There, there are solutions that might arise. There's other stuff you could talk about, but this is what you need. It's a very simple message, and our difficulty with a message that says, listen to this, is that our culture today, I really feel, is just polluted and, and overwhelmed with messages that are basically, listen to me, listen to this. I, I really think it was quieter in, in, the, in ancient times. I mean, somebody might have built a temple to Baal, Oh, but, you know, when you walked over the hill and you didn't see it, you weren't looking at it, you didn't have to think about it. They might have been having a festival to some god of some kind in some city. You didn't have to go. I mean, even if the neighbor pounded on your door and said, we're making cakes for the queen of heaven today, you want to come? You could say, no, no, I'm busy. But how do you get away from constant cries for your attention in our culture today? I do not know. What is your favorite news analyst doing in that little blurb before his, his, his show comes on, the, the three or four second thing, but saying, listen to me, you've got to hear this. Okay, he's saying, he'll, he'll be saying, you've got to know what's been going on and you need to listen to me. You need to know what the opposition is doing. Listen to me. You need to know that they're a complete waste of life. Listen to me. And you, you, you need to know this because this is looming and this is big. That's what those little blurbs are. So that, and then you go through the, the news analyst show. And it's about, well, wait and you're going to hear some more. Listen to me. You can, you, can turn, you can turn away from that and say, well, I'll get some rest because we'll have a commercial. But that's the same thing. You might be taking the wrong kind of pill. Listen to this. You're probably eating foods that are making you unhealthy. You could eat healthier foods. Listen to this. You, too, could get compensated through this wonderful, wonderful class action lawsuit. Listen to this. You don't want to, put, you don't want to miss out on that. You, too, could have the kind of vacation that will, that will satisfy your every desire. Listen to this. And you could turn off the TV and the phone will ring. Listen to this. You're missing out on this. This is something about your banking. This is about your investment, about your roof, about your windows. There's so much of that, that a simple message that God just says, look, you're in a crisis here, and Jeremiah's world was in a crisis. Listen to God. It's, it's in danger of being drowned out because we need to remember that there are always going to be voices calling to us, saying, here is something that everybody needs, that you need to know, and you need the voices with authority. Now, authority actually, actually works. It's actually a thing. I, and I, I was born in 1960, so that is why I'm old and gray now, right? But 1960, there were two things going on. One was that people, when I became aware of the national situation, people were questioning authority. Why should, why should authority order us about? And uh, I find it amusing that so many people who are part of that culture are extremely rules-oriented now, you know, and, but it, that, that's a different situation. But then you found that authority was a natural part of life. It, it, it did a thing that, that 
that I never thought it could do. Because, you know, I was in, when I was in school, almost nobody did anything I told them to do. Everybody, my family were all older than me. They didn't take orders from me. My, most of my playmates were larger than me. They didn't take orders from me. Nobody did, but I got a job. And I began supervising a shift of workers at the chemical plant. And suddenly I have authority. Magical, seemingly. Because, you know, we had, we, we made one chemical, it was black, carbon, and, and it came in different sizes. We also came this powder. So we had a, a powder bin in, on, on one of the workstations. And it, it kept there to, amazingly, hold powder. And the powdered chemical, and when you wanted some, you opened the hole at the bottom and let the powder fall out, which was a dirty enough job as it was, because it was poof, like, just like baby powder. Now, the powder bin, would not, it being powder, now and then you would open the slide at the bottom and nothing would come out, because it's powder, it clumps. And it was somebody's job to crawl into the powder bin from the top, down a rickety old ladder holding a big metal rake and shoof that stuff down into the hole. Dirtiest, you would become the dirtiest person in the county at the very moment. That was all, you were black, you were covered, you hit this and a big poof of dust would come out. What soul would go in there and do that? Well, I was an authority, it wasn't gonna be this soul. Somebody else had that work, that, that was his job station and I could say, you need to go rake the powder bin. And like magic, they went and did it. Because there was a line of authority. I was the supervisor. I was directing the work. It needed done. It's your job to do it. It's so amazing to me who, going through life, nobody ever, nobody took orders from me. But now they did. That's a line of authority. And it doesn't work the other way. I couldn't go tell the plant manager he needed to get in the powder bin, right? I would have to persuade. I would have to say, it's great in the power powder bin. You, you haven't lived till you've been down in the powder bin. You may, maybe you should inspect the condition of the powder bin. Then it might happen. But I could not order somebody above me to do that. Authority. Authority is a thing. It works. It's a part of life. It's always going to be. And the human being needs to seek God's authority. If you think about it, you, you're, a person is bound to become theological. Because what you're going to understand is there are so many voices. There are so many demands upon our time and attention. There are so many things set before us that you should really believe this. This is persuasive. And we're going to live long enough to understand that so many of those voices are wrong. Some of them have no, they don't have our best interest at heart. Some are coming from self-centered motives. Some are coming from, you know, bad information. Some are being paid to say things. In other words, I am surrounded by people who are not telling the unvarnished truth. And if you think about it, a human being needs truth. We're, we're built to appreciate it. Beauty and truth. God has made a wonderful creation, and I can look at, look at the beautiful things he has made, and I'm just built to respond to that. God has also established truth, that there are statements you can make that are consonant with reality. There are things that you can point to that are true and can be depended on, and God is the ultimate source of truth. And so a, a genuine human heart is not going to be satisfied with mixed messages. A genuine human heart is not going to be satisfied, well, that message is probably false, but I'll go along with it anyway. That's not. How can you, you can't believe something is false if you think it's false. It means you don't believe it. The human heart is supposed to seek after God's truth. And we have found his truth to be displayed in Scripture, which is where Jeremiah was pointing. He was saying, you remember the book of Deuteronomy. I just summed it up for you in eight, eight verses, but God called his people out. He rescued them from Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness. He set them before the promised land. He says, this is the land I'm going to give you, and you are going to live in it, and at the same time, you're going to listen to me. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, if that message that Jeremiah gave is a very hopeful message. His message was given to a people in crisis. 
They're, they're, they've never been so close to destruction as they are at the moment that Jeremiah is talking to them. You know, it is quite true that in the city of Babylon, a few hundred miles away, there are people, when Jeremiah is speaking, planning to destroy Jerusalem, to burn it, to capture it, to defeat its armies, to carry its people into captivity, all the ones that survived the disease and the disaster of war. There would be nothing left. And the people in Babylon, the king in Babylon is listening to his generals and says, when shall we attack Jerusalem and take all, take all its people and goods as plunder and burn it to the ground? They say, well, we'll probably go to the town of Gezer first and then we'll go over to Hazor and then we'll take a left-hand turn and come to Jerusalem. The plans are made. And Jeremiah speaks in this time of crisis and says, obey the Lord. Now, why would he even bring it up? if nothing wonderful was, was, was to happen in response to their obedience. Take it, to, take it to the bank. It is guaranteed. Jeremiah is giving this to people, that un, an unlikely people, a people who had not been listening and saying, if you turn to the Lord, there will be a redemptive result. He would not say return to the Lord to people who couldn't possibly manage to do it. He would not challenge people to obey the Lord if his... Grace and his spirit would not be alongside to help them obey. Something good, something, something from the hand of God, a miracle is at hand if they hear these words. So it's, a, so it's a hopeful word. I know Jeremiah said, cursed be the man who doesn't obey, because it was a choice between following God or ending up with nothing. But that challenge is made. The invitation is made to, to listen to God at this moment of crisis and see God work. And it is a mature response that God is looking for. In other words, that you heard this, and it worked in your heart, you, you examined and found out for yourself the truth of what God was calling you to do, what living in obedience to God looked like, and you made a response. Because, you know, when, it, when you have a passage like this, that Jeremiah says, obey God, listen to God, other people did not listen to God. That's not turning us. You listen to God. It's very simple, but you should not come away with the idea that what God is really hoping for is, well, if I could just have some people around here that didn't sin. I'm, I'm tired of watching sin. God is probably tired of watching sin as much as the omnipotent majesty can be tired of anything. I'm not sure that's workable. But he's not saying, I'm, I'm sick and tired of looking at sin. He wants people to respond to him because he has a plan in motion. He has a work of grace that he has already done. And it's in here, as he has summarized the book of De Deuteronomy, that you're going to become a people that belong to him. That's what he said. You will be my people. In other words, a witness for him, that your life will be marked by we are followers of God. We are people who have our complete trust in him. We are people who rely upon his word, who have found that he has been faithful to it, and we owe everything to him. That's what it meant to be in Israel. That's what it meant to be in Jerusalem, the city that God established for his people. I will be your, and I will be your God. You will learn to rely upon me. You will learn to rely upon me, and that it adds something to knowledge of his word, what his commands might for my life might be, because if, you are, if he is being your God and he is providing for you, which is in here, I will give you the land flowing with milk and honey, you're going to learn that much more about the heart and the nature of God in his answered prayers, in his response to your need, in the way that he was already in preparation for the, for the crisis that you faced, that he was, he was there with his love before you ever asked for it, that you cried out to him and he was, he was faithful. You're a witness to him because you are carrying forward his promise. You're carrying forward his character. You're living in your life what a person is that, that loves and obeys God looks like. And also you're learning so much more about God as you go through. You see, this is what God intended in bringing Israel into the promised land. It's God's answer to the mess that the world is in, and God is quite aware that the world is in a mess. That's, that's, the, that's the 
the, the journey that you take reading the Bible. You read the first 11 verses, you have the creation. Creation was wonderful, and then people fell from grace. They lost, the, lost their love of God, their relationship to God. They're cast out of the garden. You have t- terrible things like the flood. You have murders and wars. And then finally, the very doubtful situation of the Tower of Babel, and you say, this is the disease of human life right in front of me. And in chapter 12, God says, Abraham, come here. And now go to the land I will show you. And the whole story of Israel starts. God's response to the disaster that is human sinfulness is Abraham and thence Israel to show the world what, it, what a human being that walks with God, is obedient to God, and depends fully on God is all about. It's a mature response. It's not just having a train of ideas in your head saying, God said I should not do these things, not do these. As much as I can remember, I won't do this and I will do that. That's, that's hardly that. That's not God wants people who won't sin. Yes, he does. But he wants people that he has their heart. It looks like this. When I had children, you could not relax for the first year at all, right? Because the children are an incredible bundle of needs. They're truly pleasant. I loved them. It was great. But they had to be fed. They had to be carried about. They had to be cleansed. They had to be, you know, are they too hot? Are they too cold? They can get out of sorts. You need to comfort them. You need to put them to bed, check on, see if they're breathing while they're sleeping, get them up at the right time. And then it got harder. I really like the point. One point in an infant life when they could sit them up, put them on a blanket with toys, and they were happy. That stage never lasted long enough for me. But when they began to move around on their own, you had a whole, they're all the same problems. They still needed fed, comforted, uh, put to bed, got up, dressed, warm, clothed, carried around, you know, taken around to places. But then they can just go in random directions. You never knew which direction they would go. They might go halfway up the steps and inevitably fall back down. And you feel very bad and guilty about that. They could also just go up to an an unlatched screen door and push it and walk out to who knows where. There was no rest. There was, it was constant anxiety. You had to put gates on the steps and latches on the doors and things. And then finally, when that child knew not to go out the door at random, just, just knew that's where it belonged, that this was its home, this was where nurture and love and care and instruction and everything good was, then you could kind of relax. Because you have that child's heart. That is the process you begin, and it continues through their teenagers and then on. That you're not so much trying to find, oh, I'm going to limit him here, I'm going to box him off there, I'm going to chain him up over here, don't chain him up. But anyway, but when you have their heart, at whatever age, you have a sense of being able to relax. When God has your heart, I'm not sure it's theologically correct to say he can relax. But he is accomplishing what he has set about to do in the Old Testament. You are hearing his voice. You are listening to him. Thus you become a witness for him for what the human life looks like that is ordered by God and not disordered by sin. And you're also constantly, every day, every week, learning more about him by learning to rely upon him as you go through time together. That was God's purpose in the Old Testament, and it is only continued in a greater extent in the New because Jesus heals our problem of sin. He takes that guilt that we feel, that feeling of defeat, the feeling that we have have irreparably broken this and it can never be fixed, and he fixes it with the cross and says, says, this is done. I will not hold this against you anymore. This is all forgiven, and I put myself on the line for this. And then Jesus, after the resurrection, calls his disciples together, and what does he say? Go into all the world and make disciples. In other words, you're a witness. Something about you is going to show people what a life filled with God looks like. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. Again, it is witness, as the Israelites to have. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. In other words, mark yourselves and mark all who will come with the stamp that these belong to the Christ who has revealed himself to us. And, he says, I am with you always. Your witness and God's care. As much as in Deuteronomy you were to heed God and God would provide for you in the land. Except that Jesus said you can go anywhere in the world and live as a witness. You cannot go any place on this globe, but I will be there. It is greater and vaster, and he is bringing a people, the church, into existence who will show what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit, to be entirely sourced by the Father, to living in obedience to God. And Jesus did not say, go into all the world and make disciples unless you're prone to making mistakes, then I don't want you. He doesn't do that. He tells us to go. We know what yesterday was like and that it wasn't your best performance. We know what what you were like when you were young. Oh, boy, do we know what you were like when you were young. We know the things that habitually trip you up. Jesus tells these people to go. Right now, take his hand and obey. It is remarkable that Jeremiah called the people to obey. But it was only a a pointer to how gracious the Lord's call is. It was it was almost unbelievable that Jeremiah would say to a people, I need you to trust God at this point. I need you to obey his word. I need you to turn your heart around and see what that word was, because they had made no headway in following following God. When Jeremiah came out and said about, we need to listen to the word of Jehovah, we need to hear the word of the Lord, they it, it They knew what he was talking about, but they said, boy, isn't he like two generations out of phase. They say, when was the last, was it, there was a king, the last king that was big on following the Lord. Which one was, oh, Josiah. They'd say that. That's what they would say. He's dead. And there were three dead kings after him. We're on to something new. And yet Jeremiah says, obey the Lord. We know what your past has been like. We know what your track record's like. We know the failures you've had. Obey the Lord. This is where your home is. This is what you were created to be. This is what the fullness of a human life in the eyes of God looks like, and you need to turn to that. You're in the midst of a national crisis. Can't say anything else to you but obey the Lord. You might be in the middle of a personal crisis. I can't say anything else to you but obey the Lord. He is where your home is. He is where your life is. He just wants to have your heart. And he'll make it right. You know, I talked, by way of illustration, I talked some years ago to a a homeless person. They're not as hard to find as you might suppose. And um, and this particular one, we we were helping through the church. uh, Because there was a child involved. It wasn't... Well, it was a bad situation. They're actually living in an abandoned hotel. That's kind of creepy. So no water, no clean place to stay, no sewage, no regular food, no way to refrigerate food, no way to store clothes. No, nothing in that situation was good. And I was talking to this person, and, and you know, homelessness has many causes, and there are many, many remedies that you can, you can present, resources you can bring to bear. But I was talking to this person. It was interesting. Because I haven't ha- happened to ask them, uh, where, do, where can you go? What, what's your family? Where, where's your family? Your parents. It was a young person, so parents was relevant. Oh, they're just 20 miles away. Well, would they, could you go stay? With, would they take you in? Yeah. And we talked about it. I, I didn't want to tell somebody to go back to an abuser. I didn't want to t- tell somebody to go back to somebody who was exploitative. If they're terribly dysfunctional or, or, or addicted to all kinds of substances, we don't want to do that. There was nothing particular to be said against the mom and dad. They take you back? Yeah. Well, why don't you? I'm, I'm, you know, simple me. I mean, again, there are many ways and situations that go on with homelessness, but I was just saying, saying, well, look, hallelujah, this person isn't necessarily homeless. They've got a home to go to. Take your kid and go. Well, they didn't want to. 
not initially. It's more complicated than that. Well, how is it complicated? Well, no, we're not abusive. We're not, not addicted. We don't exploit. We're not, not terrible people, not violent, none of this. Well, it's just more complicated. Well, I don't know what could be more complicated than living out on the street, living in an abandoned hotel. I don't know what, more, what could be more complicated than not knowing where your next meal is because you can only carry so much food with you. I don't know what's more complicated than your, than your infant being in danger. I don't know what's more complicated than being prey and at risk to being trafficked. All that sounds pretty complicated. You want to know what they did. I more want to know what you will do. Because this is a simple, you know, the position this person was in is I'm just saying go home. God is just saying come home. Obey. You know the difficulties you've had with God. You know where you've, you've been arguing with him. You know the things where you're saying, I'm going to give Jesus everything except this little attitude. I like it. I'm going to get let the Lord be Lord of it all, 98% of it, and just bit over here, that's going to be for me. I'm going to give, oh, the Lord can have tithe, they can have everything, but not that particular part of time. The challenge to obey should strike the conscience. It is not just that God is so frustrated with you making mistakes, he wants your heart that you would live as a witness to him to what it means to pattern your life after the heart of Christ and then in that life learn to depend upon him. Let us pray. Father, we, we ask that in our hearts we, we understand your call. Lord, and, and thank you that that call can come no matter what has, been, what has passed before that it comes fresh and new each morning. Today is a day to obey. Today is a day to listen to this word, to know that this is a redemptive God that stands before us with help, with healing in his wings, with counsel for our despair. If you want to just be telling God all, all that you want today, God, that today I won't hold it back. Today I'm going to trust you for that. Today I, I will... Turn around and heed your words. I know your words, Lord, are going to be about forgiveness. They're going to be about laying aside anger. I know they, they're going to be about generosity, about, about self-control, about patience. And Lord, I'm all in for that. If you will recognize that I am weak and you are strong. And this begins with a, with a walk of, of salvation, walk with Christ, that we don't have this to do on our own. In fact, we cannot. But he has wiped away the guilt of sin with the cross. And if you would like Jesus to be that Savior, you need to come forward and ask him for forgiveness and, and seek him for the new life that he gives. But for all, this is a time of prayer as they sing to seek God and to allow him to work his will in your life. In Jesus' name, amen.